All right, engineers, so in this video, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about adaptive immunity. So we've already talked a lot about the inflammatory response, right? We discussed it in very, very, very great detail. Now what we're gonna go ahead and do is we're gonna take a look specifically inside of the lymph node. If you remember, do you remember we had those macrophages and those neutrophils? And what were happening? Let's look, remember? If we come over here, we had the macrophages right here. And remember what these macrophages were doing? They were carrying with them what? The antigen, right? But they were carrying it on its actual membrane surface. How? Remember what they had on their membrane surface right here? They had MHC2 molecules, right? So MHC2 molecules. And with that, they had the foreign antigen that they actually pulled away from that bacterial microbe, right? And then what else? The neutrophils actually exocytosed their antigens into the extracellular fluid. So now what we're going to do is we're going to follow these free antigens and then we're going to follow this antigen presenting cell into the lymph node and let's get in it, all right? So here we go. So these guys are going to come in here now. They're going to flow in here and let's go ahead and take a look over here. So what kind of cells, if we're looking inside of the lymph node, the lymph node has these things called germinal centers, right? And germinal centers are where there's a large amount of B cells. This cell right here is called a B lymphocyte. Now the B lymphocyte has specific types of receptors that are present on its cell membrane, right? What are these receptors right here called? They're actually called B cell receptors, or uh, B cell receptors are usually designed to be what's called um, antibodies. Specific type of antibody is IgD antibody, and we'll talk about those in a separate video. But again, what are these things right here called? They're called B cell receptors. And what happens with these B cell receptors is these B cell receptors are formed in a very special way. They undergo recombination. And when they undergo this recombination, you know the DNA with inside of the B cell it can actually undergo shuffling. It can do the same thing that those MHC2 molecules and MHC1s do, where it can shuffle its DNA and produce different types. Every single one of these B cell receptors are different in their binding domain. So they can bind different types of antigens. Again, what do I mean by that? Let's say I have three different types of antigens. A circle, a square antigen, and a triangular antigen. And these are from the bacteria. And they're just circulating in here, right? We'd have to have a B cell receptor that would fit perfectly for the circular antigen. We'd have to have a square shaped receptor to fit this square antigen. And we'd have to have a triangular shaped B cell receptor to fit the triangular antigen. That's what all of these guys are. They can undergo specific recombination to form different B cell receptors. So now, what was that thing circulating in here? Here was our antigen, our free antigen, right? So we had these free antigens that were circulating in this area. And by random chance, that free antigen will bind onto a B cell or a B lymphocyte with the B cell receptor perfectly designed to fit that antigen by random chance. And when it binds onto this, it can signal different types of uh, signaling mechanisms into this actual B cell's nucleus, activating the B cell. Because you know previously, this B lymphocyte is technically naive. It's a naive B lymphocyte, meaning it has receptors, but it hasn't undergone a specific activation mechanism yet. So it hasn't undergone its, uh, its immunogenicity response yet. So now it's going to become active and it's going to become a little bit more mature. So now what happens to this B lymphocyte? This B lymphocyte will do what's called receptor-mediated endocytosis. What does that mean? That means it'll actually take in, so imagine again, remember that thing's the pseudopods? So what will happen here? Let's say the antigen actually, or that uh, red antigen, binds over here too. So see it comes over here and binds to this surface right here. Then what happens? The cell membrane does those things where it makes those pseudopods, right? So it makes those pseudopods or it actually does another mechanism where it pulls the membrane down by binding these things called clathrins, and we form these clathrin-coated pits, and then we form these clathrin-coated vesicles, right? And it pulls it inside now. So now we have this endosome inside here, and what's inside this? We have the B cell receptor with the foreign antigen bound to it. And then what can happen is, on chromosome number six of the B cell, what can he do? he can produce a specific molecule. That specific molecule fits perfectly to that antigen. And look what it is. 
We already know what this one is. We already talked about him. He's an MHC2 molecule. And then he can come up and get fused onto the cell membrane. So again, what will happen with this B cell right here? Look, it'll actually become activated. And whenever it's activated, what does it have on its cell membrane? It has these B cell receptors, right? But we want that one B cell receptor that we responded to, we want with us to be able to make more specific types of antibodies specific to that right there. So again, what do we expose up on the cell membrane? We expose up on the cell membrane a MHC2 molecule. And again, what are these things called? B cell receptors. And again, usually they are IgD antibodies. And with this MHC2 molecule, what do we have exposed with it? We have that foreign antigen. So again, this is our B lymphocyte. So our B lymphocyte has become activated, but it can't undergo proliferation yet. It's been activated. So now it is activated. So we have an activated B lymphocyte. How did that B lymphocyte get activated? The free antigens bound on the B cell receptors are the IgD antibodies, triggered an, triggered an intracellular mechanism to activate this B cell, right? Then what happens is the B cell will actually undergo a clathrin coated mediated process called receptor mediated endocytosis where it pulls the antigen and the antibody complex inside and then on chromosome number six it'll make MHC2 molecules to bind with that foreign antigen and present it on top of the uh, cell surface. So now what is this guy? He is an antigen presenting cell. What are the three types of antigen presenting cells again? He's an antigen presenting cell. So B lymphocytes, macrophages and dendritic cells. So now, he wants to start proliferating, but we can't do that yet. Why can't we do that yet? This is where we need to talk about our macrophage now. So this step can't occur yet until we have some type of stimulus. Let's talk about that, what stimulus is. All right, so again, this macrophage, let's track him. Look at him, he's coming over here. And now, what is he gonna do? So again, what was on that macrophage? That macrophage, if you remember, so here's the macrophage, there's its genes, right? There's its DNA with the specific genes. And then what did it have exposed on its cell membrane? It had the MHC2 molecules, so MHC2 molecules with a specific foreign antigen, right? And again, just to continue with everything that we talked about before, what would it also have on its cell membrane surface? It would also have a MH. C1 molecule with some type of specifically self antigen, right? So all nucleated cells will have MHC1 and these antigen presenting cells will have MHC2 molecules. Now, this guy, what does he do? He comes and he presents this MHC2 molecule and the foreign antigen to a specific type of T cell. So let's draw that guy right over here. Look at this guy. Here's our T cell. Now, technically, this is a naive T cell. All right, let's actually, let's go over this. So this is actually a naive T helper cell. So again, what does that mean by it's naive? It means it has receptors that can respond to these molecules, but it's not activated yet. It's not specific. It doesn't know exactly what it's actually gonna go into and differentiate into. So now, what happens? This MHC2 molecule, there's a specific molecule that has to recognize this MHC2. Let's make this T cell a little bit longer. So again, what is that molecule called that interacts right here? Look at this guy. He is a, let's make him a green molecule. So look here, here's this green molecule and it fits perfectly with this MHC2 molecule. Then it has a blue molecule a blue molecule that fits perfectly to that foreign antigen. What are these two proteins called? This blue protein that fits perfectly to the actual foreign antigen is called a T cell receptor. Sometimes they just denote it TCR. So it's TCR positive, right? So this is a TCR positive cell. What is this green protein right here called? This green protein right here is actually called cluster differentiation protein four. So this is called a CD4. So this is a CD4 positive, all right, CD4 positive cell. So now look at this. 
We have a naive T helper cell. The T cell receptor reacted. What is this red molecule again? Let's actually denote what that red molecule is. That red molecule is the foreign antigen. So it's the foreign antigen. The foreign antigen is interacting with the T cell receptor specific to that antigen. What do I mean? Again, every single T cell will have different types of T cell receptors specific to each type of antigen. Let's make this more clear. We have a circular antigen, square antigen, triangular antigen. Each type of TCR is specific to this type of antigen. So if it's actually, so that's a blue protein, right? If this is the TCR, if that's the antigen, the TCR has to be this shape. If the, the actual antigen is square shaped, the TCR has to be specifically this shaped. And if the antigen is this shape, then the TCR has to specifically be this shape. And what is that due to? That's due to recombination. Switching and shuffling those genes due to what's called RAG1 and RAG2 genes, which are recombination enzymes, we'll talk about that in T cell development, which are producing these different types of T cell receptors, okay? So this guy just happens to run into the perfect T cell that can fit that antigen. Now what happens? There's one more thing that needs to happen. There is proteins inside here. They're called CD3 molecules. It's called CD3. And the CD3 molecule is actually going to kind of act as a, uh, a signaling molecule inside the cell. We'll talk about him in just a second. But there's another molecule that we have to talk about. Over here, it's going to have this big, big, big molecule here that's actually going to be present on the T cell. Let's actually make him smaller then. Let's actually make him like this. So here's the T cell. It has a specific molecule present on its cell membrane. And this molecule is called CD28. CD28. And then on the macrophage, it has a specific protein that can stretch and interact with that. So look at this. Look at that protein right there. This protein right here that interacts with CD28 is called B7. So again, what two proteins interacted here? We have B7 interacting, and we have CD28 interacting. When they interact, this triggers a co-stimulation reaction. So again, this, re this reaction right here, this is the primary stimulation. MHC2 with the CD4, T cell receptor with the foreign antigen, activates CD3. That's gonna send signals to the nucleus. So here is our actual nucleus with the specific DNA with the genes specific to each type of cytokine we're going to produce. That's the primary signal. So this is our primary signal. The co-stimulatory signal or the secondary signal is going to come from the interaction between B7 on the macrophage and CD28 on that naive T helper cell. So this is called, what is this again called? This is called co-stimulation. Once we have this primary signal and this co-stimulation, there's one more thing and then we're getting into the good stuff. This guy starts secreting a specific protein. It secretes a specific protein, this macrophage, and this secretes a molecule which is called interleukin-1. And interleukin-1 comes and binds onto a specific receptor on the actual T helper cell. So interleukin-1 binds onto this receptor, and it also sends another signal. So that's our third signal. So we have a third signal here. Holy crap, that's a lot of signals, right? So we have a primary signal here due to the MHC2 and the CD4 interaction. We have uh, the antigen, foreign antigen, the T cell receptor activating CD3. We have the B7 with the CD28 activating co-stimulation. And then we have interleukin-1 secreted by the macrophage, which triggers another third signal. Now what happens? Now this T cell has become activated. So when he becomes activated, he starts actually, so now this T, T helper cell is no longer naive, he's an activated T cell, and he starts secreting, it activates certain genes, all these signals, activates certain genes, and these genes lead to the production of interleukin-2. And interleukin-2 can actually come back over here and bind on its own self. So what is this called whenever something works on the same cell that secreted him? It's called an autocrine. So this interleukin is an autocrine. It works and it activates this, which sends another signal back here. 
activates these genes, and these genes start producing another cytokine. This cytokine is called interleukin-4. And then there's another cytokine that's produced also with that, which is called interleukin-5. Now what's very, very important here that we really, really understand is, is that whenever these interactions are occurring, a naive T cell, a naive T helper cell can actually turn into two different types. So what, that's why I wanted to mention it. Let's say I have T helper and I put like that for the naive, right? He can either turn into two different types of cells. A T helper one or a T helper two cell, right? In order for this to happen, the T helper not is going to have to get stimulation if it wants to become a T helper 2. It has to get stimulation from what's called interleukin 4. So interleukin 4 will also have to stimulate this process to occur. If it wants to turn into a T helper 1 cell, it needs to get stimulation from interleukin 12. And then it can drive this process. Okay? So again, we want to make T helper 2. That's who we want to make. So we need interleukin 4 stimulation. So this naive T cell actually turned into a T helper 2 cell. So it's genes that are going to be activated, the ones that we listed. Interleukin 2, interleukin 4, interleukin 5. If we were to activate T helper 1, we would activate the gamma interferon genes, and we would activate the genes to produce tumor necrotic factor alpha. So that's why we definitely want to focus on the T helper cell. And the reason why is these two factors. We absolutely need those. And I'll explain why in just a second. So again, let's erase this. So again, remember that. So now, we've produced interleukin-4 and we've produced interleukin-5. Now what happens here with these molecules? Well, first off, even before that, you see how interleukin-2 comes and stimulates this, this cell right here? And there will also be stimulation from another one that we just mentioned with, which could be interleukin-4. Before it even starts releasing interleukin-4 and interleukin-5, it starts dividing. Right? So this T cell will undergo a lot of divisions. And what was that stimulus? It was interleukin-2 and interleukin-4. Those were the stimuli in order for this naive T cell to become activated and turn into T helper 2 cells. And then what happens? These T helper 2 cells they start secreting interleukin-4, and they also start secreting interleukin-5. So more specifically, let's erase this here, because there is interleukin-4 and 5 being secreted, but it's not really being secreted from a naive T cell. It's being secreted by, by these mature T helper cells. So again, what will these guys be secreting? They'll be secreting interleukin-4 and 5. So interleukin-4 and interleukin-5. So again, I wanted to make sure that I very, very I clarify that up very, very specifically because technically interleukin 4 and 5 are actually produced by the activated or proliferated form of the T cells, the T helper 2 cells, because this was a naive T helper cell. So it responds with all of these primary co-stimulatory and third signal, releases interleukin 2, gets stimulation from interleukin 4, and that interleukin 4 will act, what? Interleukin 4, interleukin 2 will act on this actual naive T helper cell and turn on the genes to produce interleukin-4 and interleukin-5 to make T helper-2 cells. If it wanted to make T helper-1, it would have secreted interleukin-12, but we didn't. We made interleukin-4. Now, what happens with this interleukin-4 and 5? Remember this B activated B lymphocyte that we couldn't have proliferate yet? Now we can proliferate him. So what happens here? Here's our activated B lymphocyte. The first signal is interleukin-4. Interleukin-4 comes over and activates this B lymphocyte to start turning on genes to start proliferating. So now what happens? We start making tons of B cells here. So we're going to have a ton of activated B cells. So look, we have activated B cells here. They're no longer naive. And what's special about these B cells? These B cells, we've proliferated them to have BCRs specific, those IgD antibodies, those BCRs are specific to that foreign antigen. Super specific here, okay? So now it's gonna have BCRs here 
specific to that antigen and what else will it also have? It'll also have those MHC2 molecules right here with the foreign antigen exposed on the surface, right? So now, again, what would it have? MHC2 molecules with the foreign antigen and it will also have the B cell receptor specific to that foreign antigen. Then what happens? Interleukin-5 stimulates all of these, what is this called right here? I actually should explain this first. What is this called whenever these B cells start dividing? This right here, when interleukin-4 stimulates this step right here, right? This is called clonal expansion. So this right here is called clonal expansion. So these guys are going to expand and undergo excessive proliferation making tons of these B cells activated, and now these actual B cells are immunocompetent and specifically able to recognize any type of foreign antigen because of these specific B cell receptors. Now, interleukin-5 activates these B cells and causes them, some of them, to start differentiating. So what happens, interleukin-5 actually works right here, right? Interleukin-5 actually works specifically at that step right there. And then what happens? Now some of these B cells start undergoing differentiation and they turn into a specific type of B cell. So again, what is this guy right here called? He's got a very, very prominent, very, very prominent um, rough endoplasmic reticulum that I'm drawing with these lines here. These are called plasma cells. Now it can actually, um, whenever it differentiates, it can differentiate also into memory B cells. So there's two different types of cells that can actually be formed from this process. Whenever interleukin-5 causes differentiation, he works on these expanded, clonally expanded B cells and causes some of them to turn into memory B cells with that specific B cell receptor common to that foreign antigen so that we are ever exposed to it again, it is ready for that. So now it has a specific B cell receptor that will always be ready to uh, respond to that, that antigen ever again, a second exposure, third exposure, infinity exposures, right? The other ones will become effector cells or plasma cells. And these plasma cells, there is actually one more interleukin that can be secreted here called interleukin-6. And interleukin-5 and interleukin-6 can actually stimulate these plasma cells, stimulate the plasma cell formation and interleukin-5 and interleukin-6 can also stimulate the plasma cells to start secreting antibodies. So it starts secreting antibodies. And what are these molecules right here? These are antibodies. And it can cause these, these antibodies that are being secreted, guess what? These antibodies that are being secreted are going to be specific to that foreign antigen very, very specific to that foreign antigen. What do I mean? Let's go back to this again. Let's say here's the antigen. It's a circular antigen, square antigen, star antigen. What happens? These antibodies are specific, and I'll explain why in the future videos, that they have a specific variable region that can actually change from antibody to antibody. In other words, again, recombination. You can shuffle the DNA to produce different types of antibodies with different types of variable regions, which can bind to different types of antigens. So these antibodies being produced here by these plasma cells, they are specific to that foreign antigen from that microbe that we've been dealing with this whole time. It's so beautiful how all this stuff is interconnected, right? So now what can these antibodies do? These antibodies can bind on to these antigens some of these antigens might be bound to specifically a bacteria, that bacteria that we were dealing with before, or it could be free antigens, all right? And then what can happen with that? Tons of things can happen with that, and we'll get into more detail in that when we talk about antibodies and what they can do. Just in general, I'll write this list down, but I'll explain it in more detail in the antibody videos. It can actually bind to this. It can bind to all, let's say here, here's all the antigens on that bacteria. These antibodies could bind to every single surface here. And if they bind every single surface, they block this bacteria from maybe attaching to certain types of our healthy host cells and damaging it, right? That's called neutralization. 
So it can neutralize this bacterial or viral molecule, right? Let's say that this antibody binds with this freely circulating antigen. And that actually causes a precipitation out of the actual uh, reaction. So we have what's called a precipitation reaction. So a precipitation reaction could actually enhance opsonization, but it also can cause problems because sometimes if there is free antigen antibody complexes, there is a chance that they can get deposited into tissues and cause a type 3 hypersensitivity, right? So precipitation, neutralization, what if those antibodies bind on to that same bacteria? Remember that bacteria that we talked about in the complement system? Now this might be coming back a little bit, right? What was that complement system able to do? You were able to produce a whole bunch of different proteins, and what were those proteins able to do? They were able to produce a membrane attack complex. And that membrane attack complex caused lysis of the cell. So that's another thing that could happen. There could be lysis, there could be precipitation, there could be neutralization. One other thing, let's say that you get mismatched blood. Remember whenever I talked about that in blood? We talked about mismatched blood transfusions. If you have red blood cells that you aren't supposed to have, you can actually have, so let's say here's the antigens. Let's say that this person gave, uh, they were given incompatible blood. You can have antibodies that could literally bind these actual points right here and cause the actual red blood cells. Remember when there's an antigen antibody complex, what is that called? It's called agglutination. Agglutination. So again, what do we have so far? We have agglutination, we have neutralization, we have precipitation, we have lysis. One more I'll talk about, but again, we'll get into this in more detail when we talk about this in antibodies. What if I have this right here, that antigen binds there, and then when that antigen bind, when the antibody binds to the antigen, it can activate, maybe it does two things. Let's say we have two factors that it could affect here. Say so it binds there, one activates complement system. Remember the whole complement system? And it could stop at C3B. And if it stops at C3B, it can activate our actual macrophages to come in and start eating that because it has C3B receptors. That's one thing. What is that called? And again, it could also just do directly with the actual macrophages. So the macrophages could actually just eat this directly. And what is this process right here called? This is called opsonization. All right, so so far we have a ton of things that's happened here. These antibodies can cause neutralization reaction. They can cause a precipitation reaction. They can initiate lysis of the bacteria or certain types of fungi. They can cause an agglutination reaction and some type of mismatched blood transfusion. Or we can even opsonize them and making it tasty, right? So again, if this was that foreign bacteria that we talked about, let's say that that was that foreign bacteria, what can happen? We can do an antibody-mediated opsonization just right here, or we can do complement up to C3B, and then that enhances the opsonization also, right? So that's going to go back to how our adaptive immunity links up with the innate immunity. Now, real quickly, you see all this right here that we talked about with those free antigens? Those free antigens and how that whole pathway of how we actually took them in, expressed them on class two, went throughout this whole proliferation process, and how we also depended upon these T helper cells to produce all these cytokines. This right here that we have talked about is called humoral immunity. That's what this is. This is humoral immunity. Humoral immunity is, in a nutshell, basically everything we talked to up to this point, with the B cells being activated by the free antigens, then responding to these actual uh, cytokines from the macrophage interacting with the T helper cell, becoming activated in T helper 2, producing interleukin 4, interleukin 5, interleukin 6, and causing these B cells to proliferate and produce antibodies. That is all the humoral immunity response. Now we got to talk about one more type of immunity for the adaptive, and that is our cell mediated immunity, which is mediated through cytotoxic T cells. So now, let's say here, Let's say that macrophage, let's say I had a macrophage um, or a T helper cell that happened to get um, infected by cancer. Let's say that there was actually a cell here. Let's just say here in general. Not even that, just say there's a general cell here. Here's our general cell. And this cell has been infected with cancer. Let's say it's a cancerous infected. Let's say it could be cancerous, could be viral. So if there's a cancerous cell, or a viral infected cell, 
Again, what do all nucleated cells have? They have class one molecules, M, H, C, class one molecules. And then what else do they have exposed with it? They have a self antigen. There's another type of T cell that we haven't talked about yet. Look at this guy. This is called a T cytotoxic, cytotoxic cell. So these are T cytotoxic cells. So these T cytotoxic cells are very, very picky. They love to recognize class one molecules. So they have a specific protein here that's designed to recognize these class one molecules, right? And they have another protein which is called a TCR, but this TCR, normally you don't want it to recognize your own self antigens because, and we'll talk about why in T cell development, because it could lead to autoimmune disease or just damage to your own tissue cells. So now, what happens in cancerous infected cells or viral cells? Two things can happen. Let's say that this is a virus infected cell. If it's a virus infected cell, so if this was infected with a virus, viruses can actually sometimes get integrated into our own DNA and can lead to the production of viral proteins. And those viral proteins are endogenous proteins. And these endogenous proteins can actually get integrated onto this self-peptide. So look what can happen here. I can actually have a self-peptide and this viral peptide added on there. If that happens, and this T cytotoxic cell has this, what is this red protein called? This red protein is called CD8 positive protein, right? And what is this actual black protein right here called? This black protein is called a TCR or T cell receptor. If this, and there's a self peptide here, which is the blue one, and then this viral peptide, which is added right there. Now, let's say by chance this TCR recognizes that viral peptide there. So recognize there's something funky with this cell. This cell is cancerous or it's virus infected, right? Then what's it going to happen? It's pissed. It's going to do something about this, right? So now it's going to activate this guy and he's going to start producing specific types of proteins. What are these proteins called? One of them is called perforins. Now perforins are basically going to produce holes inside the membrane. So imagine I draw here a whole bunch of little black proteins here creating holes inside of the cell membrane. Then what happens? It produces another molecule. And this molecule is called granzymes. So now granzymes will actually move through these pores. And when they move through the pores, they'll come in here and they'll activate a specific set of genes. What are those genes called? They're called pro-apoptotic genes. So they're called pro-apoptotic genes. So there's a set of genes in here that are going to be activated. Now I'm going to show the exact mechanism of the apoptosis here quick. So again, here's the DNA. And again, what's happening? There's going to be granzymes floating in here, activating a set of genes which are called the pro-apoptotic genes. These pro-apoptotic genes, what is apoptosis actually? Apoptosis is programmed cell death, right? So how is it gonna do it? It's gonna activate this set of genes here, these pro-apoptotic genes, and these genes are responsible for producing a protein called BAX. And what happens? What else do we have inside here? We also love to have mitochondria, right? So we have a mitochondria in here. Now what's so special about the mitochondria? Well, on the mitochondria, there's a specific protein here. This protein that's actually inside of the cell, I'm sorry, within inside of the actual membrane, this is a phospholipid bilayer though, of the mitochondria, that protein is called a BCL2. So it's called BCL2. What happens is BAX is actually a protein, imagine them like this. So imagine BAX is like this. So again, what is this thing right here called? BAX. BAX will actually bind onto the BCL2 and pull the BCL2 out. So then when BCL2 is pulled out, so let's imagine I, I do that over here. Let's say I have Bax over here. He yanks out the BCL2. So he pulls out the BCL2, pulls it right out, and then look what happens here. There's a molecule in here called cytochrome C. 
And when cytochrome C gets out here, it activates caspases, and then these caspases can start causing proteolytic destruction of multiple things with inside of the cell and eventually cause the cell to die. And what is that called? This is called apoptosis. So again, this is called cell mediated immunity. And how is that regulated? It's regulated through the cytotoxic T cells, right? Either by recognizing these uh, foreign endogenous viral antigens or maybe even cancerous antigens bound with the self peptides. This would be for cancerous cells, viral cells. And one more thing, cell mediated immunity, just think about it like this. It's occurring because these things, these viral or pathogenic molecules are inside of the cell. They're damaging the cell. They've already caused a lot of damage inside of the cell. It's an internal problem. Humoral immunity is an external problem. What do I mean by that? It was a free antigen that actually activated this B cell to start undergoing this whole proliferative process. So humoral immunity, kind of think about the humoral fluid. So it's occurring because of free antigens causing this process, whereas the antigens in this case are endogenous and are occurring inside of the cell, where the actual humoral is exogenous. Okay, now let's finish up with the natural killer cells. But remember, natural killer cells are not a part of our adaptive immunity, and I'll explain why. So natural killer cells are just basically large A granular lymphocytes. Now, they can kill by three ways. Let's say here I have a cell, another cell, and another cell. Each one of these cells have three different types of reasons why it would be killed. One is kind of going off of what this guy had. Let's say that this guy has no MHC1 molecules expressed on the surface. Because you know all nucleated cells should have MHC1 molecules. You have to know that. Next thing, what will be this next molecule? This next molecule right here is called MECA. And MECA is just a different type of MHC1 molecule. It's, it's similar to it. Real quick, MHC molecules usually have a specific type of structure here. They have what's called an alpha-1, an alpha-2, an alpha-3, and a beta-2 structure. That's the structure of MHC molecules. They usually have an alpha-1, alpha-2, alpha-3, and a beta-2 molecule. In MECA, there's no beta-2. Okay, So it's kind of like MHC1 or MHC2, but it's lacking the beta-2 microglobin. So what happens here? If they recognize the MECA, they're going to kill it that way. Okay, what's the last one? It could also do it through IgG mechanisms. So remember that there's some type of foreign antigen here, and then there is a IgG antibody. Then it can also recognize this cell and kill it. How does it kill it? The same way the cytotoxic T cells do. What will it do? It will release perforins. What will these perforins do? Create holes inside of these membranes, and then it will secrete granzymes. And the granzymes will do what? The granzymes will act on the pro-apoptotic genes, activate BACs. BACs will then pull BCL2 out of the mitochondria opening it up for cytochrome C to come out, and then cytochrome C will then cause activation of caspases and lead to proteolytic destruction of the cell, right? And cause apoptosis. So again, one more time, guys, let's finish up here and let's recap everything, just a, a general overview of this. Humoral immunity and cell-mediated immunity are part of your adaptive immunity, right? Humoral immunity, again, how would you explain that? It's due to freely circulating antigens, things that are outside of the cell. Exogenous. Exogenous means it's, it's actually an antigen that's actually outside of the cell, right? It is an exogenous protein. So the problem here is with things outside in the fluid. Remember who released all those free antigens into the fluid? It was the neutrophils. And whenever that happened, it activated the B cell from the external side and then triggered all this cascade events, right, in order for this B cell to get activated. But what else had to happen here? We also had to have the macrophage come over here present his MHC2 molecule in the foreign antigen, and it's still external. It's not inside of the T cell. 
it's going to signal these actions, it's going to produce signals to activate the T helper cell to produce a ton of different types of interleukins and cytokines. And those will be interleukin 4, interleukin 5, and interleukin 6. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to activate the B cells to switch on the genes to produce antibodies. That whole event is humoral immunity. And it's all designed to take care of the things that are outside of the cell in the humoral fluid, we call it, right? Cell mediated is a problem with things inside of the cell, endogenous molecules, like due to viral proteins or cancerous peptides that are produced as a result, right? Those are going to be the problem because it's inside of the cell. It's already invaded, infected, and actually caused damage to the inside of the cell. There's no going back for this cell. It's done. It's destined for death. So cytotoxic T cells have to deal with that, right, by eliminating these cells because the problem is inside of the cell and there's no turning back. That's cell-mediated immunity. And that is a, that's only done by cytotoxic T cells. Remember that natural killer cells are not a part of your adaptive immunity. I just wanted to show you that their mechanism is very similar to cytotoxic T cells and show you how they recognize it differently. But remember, natural killer cells are a part of your innate immune system because they can actually react with no class 1 or MECA, which is lacking a beta 2 microglobin, or IgG antibodies. So again, in a nutshell, that pretty much covers everything on adaptive immunity. Now, if you click on the right video here in the corner, we're going to do an entire overview all right, of inflammation part 1, inflammation part 2, part 3, part 4, and adaptive immunity. And if I keep it under 20 minutes, guys, I get a prize. All right, Ninja Nerds.